I wonder if you've heard these phrases before. You have great faith. According to your faith, let it be done to you. If you had faith as small as a mustard seed, if you have faith and do not doubt, O oh, you of little faith, why do you doubt? Faith, right? It's this word that's all over the biblical text. These few phrases from Jesus in the gospel are just some of the times that Jesus talks about faith. And of course, Jesus is not the only one in the biblical narrative who does that. Many, many, many times in both the New and the Old Testaments, literally hundreds of times, we hear this word faith. And in my opinion, it's probably one of the most crucial words that we use in all of Christianity. In Hebrews 11, for example, we read a list of people who had great faith. In Ephesians chapter 2, we're told about that it is by grace through faith that we are saved. In 1 Timothy, we're told to fight the good fight of faith. It's an important word. It's a common word. And I think it's a word that is totally worth examining a little bit deeper today. And if you're anything like me, there's no better way to understand these kind of complicated Christianese theological words than by an example. So I want to draw our attention today to one of the biblical writers' favorite examples of faith, a man named Abraham. Abraham is mentioned time and time and time again across the biblical narrative from Genesis through the Old Testament into the New Testament time and time again as an example of faith. Just to name a few, he's mentioned in James as an example of faith, in Hebrews as an example of faith, and in Romans as an example of faith. Abraham was a man of faith. And I love what Paul has to say about him in Romans chapter 4. Here's what it says, Romans chapter 4, beginning in verse 18. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed, and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promises of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. This is one of my favorite passages in all of scripture, and God actually used it in my life in uh, all the way back in 2014 on our long trip to the Hadza Bay people in Africa. We were watching as things were just going totally wrong, and that phrase, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed, stuck out to us like a sore thumb. It, it stood out to us in the midst of all of that difficulty. And we knew that we could put our trust in God, that he would bring about a transformation among the Hadzabe, a, a transformation that we are seeing now seven years later. And I love that statement, that, that statement against all hope, Abraham in hope believed, because I think that's a statement that we can all resonate with at some level. I think it's hard to go very long as a Christian truly following Jesus without having some kind of situation like this one that Abraham and Sarah faced where we find ourselves having to choose, do I trust God even if there's no reason to? Look at the language Paul uses. Abraham faced the fact that his body was as good as dead. Sarah's womb was also dead. That's a hopeless... Uh, like, that's a really hopeless situation, considering the fact that God's promise to them was that he would make them into a great nation. And you kind of need kids in order for that to work out. <laughs> like, you're a hundred years old and you got no kids and God says, I'm going to make you a great nation. What What's going through your head? From this simple example, we begin to really understand what faith is, in my opinion. To quote the author of Hebrews, now faith is the confidence of what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Faith is this hope that we have even when there's no reason to have hope. Faith is this belief that we hold on to even when there's no reason to have belief. Faith is knowing, trusting that what we do not see is a guarantee, right? If you're anything like me, Basically, that's where your definition of faith has drawn to a close for a very long time. That 
And in, in my mind, at least, my definition of faith was kind of this ethereal trust, like this, almost like this feeling that I had to muster up in myself. Like I have to have faith so that the thing I want to have happen will actually happen. But I think that there might be more to it than that. And I was recently reading through Hebrews 11 with Taylor. And can I just say, Taylor and I have uh, just recently started reading the Bible out loud together every night, and it has been awesome. Husbands and wives, I really encourage you, read the Bible together out loud every night. It, it's, it's a worthwhile thing to do. And just watch what the Lord will do in your life through that. I just, yeah, just a side note. Anyway, back to Hebrews 11. It's a list of the heroes of the faith. And as we were reading, we came across verse 11, Hebrews 11, 11, really easy to remember. And it's once again talking about this situation that Abraham and Sarah find themselves in, in the midst of having no children. And here's what the author says. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. As I read this passage, the last part that says, because she considered him faithful who made the promise, leaps off the page at me as if it's a light switch going on in my head. I'm not sure why it took me literally 28 years to realize this because I'm, what I'm about to say is literally so simple that you're going to be like, well, yeah, duh. But like literally, it just did not connect with me for 28 years. And I'm so excited to share it with you in case it hasn't connected for you either. Because in that moment, I realized that our faith is not grounded in some random hope floating around. It's not grounded in me being able to muster up enough faith inside of me to to get done whatever I need to get done. It's not like the, the base of it, the root of it, the grounding of it is the faithfulness of God because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. Sarah didn't have to have faith that she would be a mom simply because she had some random feeling or sense of some ethereal idea of faith. She wasn't grasping at straws. She had faith because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. We can have faith because our God is faithful, because it's in his very nature to fulfill the promises that he has made. Our faith is not some idea of faith. Our faith is in the living God, the risen Jesus. Our faith is in the living God and the risen Jesus. I love what the ESV footnote has to say about Hebrews 11. By defining faith as assurance and conviction, the author indicates that the That biblical faith is not a vague hope grounded in some imaginary wishful thinking. Instead, faith is settled confidence that something in the future, something that has not yet been seen but has been promised by God, will actually come to pass because God will bring it about. I love those words. Those are powerful words. Our faith is not groundless. It's not grasping at air. Our faith is not gr- our faith is not grounded somehow in our ability to muster something. Our faith is grounded and established and rooted in God himself. Our faith is the confidence that we have that God will indeed do the things that he said he would do, trusting that he really is the same yesterday, today, And forever, when you go back and read passages about faith, this truth will begin to leap off the page for you in the same way that it left off the page for me, that their faith was in God. Even in that Romans passage, Abraham had hope against all hope as it had been said to him. And he did not waver trusting in the promises of God. His faith was in what God had said. God made the promise. He was, Abraham was all in. He knew God's promise would come to pass. I would say even when him and Sarah 
were trying to figure it out themselves through Hagar, they still knew that Abraham would be a father. They still had faith that what God said would happen would actually happen, even though they messed up and tried to do it for God instead of allowing God to do it. But they, I think even the whole time they, they trusted that, that what God said would come to pass. Abraham's faith also it wasn't random. It wasn't grasping at straws. It wasn't hoping for hope itself. Abraham's faith was founded and established in the truth that God is faithful, that God does what he says he will do and doesn't say what he and doesn't do what he says he won't. The reason that Abraham was able to have hope, even when there was no reason for hope, is because Abraham knew and believed that God would fulfill his promises. For so many years of my life, if I was to consider this phrase, faith in God, the, the emphasis for me would have been on the word faith. And in my skin, what that means is that it was somehow dependent on me to muster it up. But now, as I consider this phrase, faith in God, the emphasis is on the word God. The emphasis is on the fact that faith Though it's something that we have to choose to have, right? We still have, Abraham still had to trust. He still had to believe. He still had to have faith in God. Sarah, the same. It's not dependent on us. It's not grounded in us. It's grounded, rooted, established in him. The confidence of faith I have is not because somehow I'm some kind of super Christian with all the faith rolling over, blah, 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 blah. My confidence of faith is because God is God. And let me tell you, it's freeing. Because if there's one thing in this universe that's unwavering, it's the God of the Bible. He is, re he is reliable, dependable, trustworthy, unchanging, unwavering, eternally and always faithfully and fully himself, the one true God of the universe. And how wonderful it is that we can place our faith in him, in someone who will never let us down, rather than in some, like grasping at straws ethereal idea. Here's the best example I can think of to illustrate this, this truth. So we often think about faith in terms of sitting in a chair. It's an example that I've heard a hundred times. I'm sure you guys have heard it a hundred times. Basically, it's the idea that you can look at a chair. There's a chair over there in the corner of the room and you can believe it's a chair and you can say that's a chair. But until you sit down in that chair, you're, there's faith is not really at work, right? And I don't have a problem with that illustration. In fact, I think it's a great illustration of what faith is. It's it, faith is is not just trusting. It's it's putting action to our trust, right? But here's what I'm trying to say with this sermon: We have faith to sit in that chair because of the master craftsman who built it. In this sense, our faith is not somehow grounded in our ability to keep the chair standing. It's not grounded in the, abil the ability of the chair itself to keep it self-holding up, though that's an important component of a chair. <laughs> our faith is in the master craftsman who designed and built that chair. Tr we are trusting and knowing that when he made it, he made it well. Now, I know it's not a perfect analogy. I mean, if you press it, it's going to fall apart just like any other analogy. But the point stands. It, we have faith because our faith is in God, the master craftsman who always fulfills his promises and never lets us down. Our God is faithful to do the things he has promised. We can put our faith in him. Now, you might be wondering, so if our faith depends on God, always fulfilling his promises, how do you know he won't break his promises? Is it because, like, how do you know? And ultimately, I think it's because we have a long history of personal and shared stories that display the faithfulness of God. Stories that we can look back on and know who God is and what he has done. Let's start with those shared stories. The Bible cram pack cram packed full of stories of God's faithfulness and his ability to come through for us stories like Shadrach Meshach and Abednego in the book of Daniel these three men refused to bow down and worship a, a false idol a massive statue of the king in that time 
and God was faithful to preserve them. They got thrown into the to a fire that was so hot that it killed the guards, yet they remained alive. And even there was a man like the Son of God <laughs> standing in the fire with them. Or look at the book of Exodus. As God provides for his people, even in the midst of their disobedience, he gives them water and food and unwearing shoes as they wander around in the wilderness. Or the way that God provided for Paul on all his missionary journeys. This guy at the end of the book of Acts literally gets bit by a snake and all the local people are like, well, when's he going to die? And then he doesn't die. (laughs) How faithful is our God? Or the way that he protects Esther as she begs for the lives of her people in the book of Esther, or or the way that he provides for the disciples as they're sent out with the authority to heal and, and cast out demons. And, and of course, the story of Abraham and Sarah, how God fulfilled his promise to make them a great nation. These are just a few of the many, many, many stories contained in the scriptures that reveal just how faithful our God is. He comes through for his people time and time and time again. He always fulfills his promises. And of course, I wouldn't want to neglect to mention the the many personal stories that we have of ways that God has faithfully been there for each of us, always coming through for his promises. My guess is that even the youngest among us have maybe even one or two. And, And if you're older or or if you lived a life of radical faith, my guess is you have lots of stories of God's faithfulness. One of my favorite stories of God's faithfulness happened a few years back. The year, 2012, um, I'm volunteering at a youth group down in Littleton. And uh, that night, the speaker, the pastor was speaking and he said he wanted each of the students and us as leaders would usually participate in the lesson. He wanted each of the students to pray and ask God this question. Who are my people? So I prayed and I remember listening and hearing this word, Hagini. Now, I didn't know what it was or who it was or where it was or anything. So I thought to myself, all right, I'll write it down and then I'll go home and research it. And I wrote down a few different spellings of it. I wasn't sure how it could be spelled. So I just wrote it down and then I went home and I Googled it. Turns out it's this tiny little town in the middle of nowhere, Papua New Guinea. And Papua New Guinea is the island just north of Australia. As I discovered it, I remembered feeling both worried and astounded. Worried in the sense that I felt like God was calling me to go there. Astounded in the fact that I I was like dumbstruck that it was really actually a place. I hope that's not too bad of a cuss word. (laughs) Like I was amazed that that like this is actually a, a real place. Like God put a real people on my heart. All the way back in 2012, I had never been on a mission trip. I had only ever kind of sensed a call from God to go to missions, but I had no idea what it meant that he was calling me to to his people. So like any other logical person, I wrote down what I discovered and I began to pray. I figured at least I can pray for these people. But I knew even even all the way back in 2012, that that was a cop out. I knew God was calling me to more. I knew God was calling me to go there. It took me two years before I finally responded to the Lord and said, okay, I was sitting in a land cruiser in the middle of nowhere, Africa in 2014, listening to God's voice and sensing him say, I don't just want you to pray for Hagini. I want you to go there. Took me another year and a half before I finally was able to go. It was a long process. I started pretty much as soon as I got back from Africa. At that point, I was just starting with the whole support raising thing and finances were super tight. They're always tight, but they were super tight. (laughs) And the cost for the plane ticket was almost twice what I was used to paying to go to Africa. And and there was no one to go with me. And even if there had been someone to go with me, I had no on-ground contact to help me once we were there. So I prayed. I prayed that the Lord would provide. And he did, starting with someone to travel with. My dad had just recently retired and I was sensing a call from him to go, or or, sorry, he was sensing a call from God to go with me. So check number one, God came through. He brought someone to travel with. A couple months later, I was put in contact with a travel agent who was able to find me a plane ticket for half the normal cost of getting to Papua New Guinea. 
it was 50 hours of travel or more, and we had to fly three quarters of the way around the world, but it was cheap and it was there. Check number two. That's when the next major decision hit. We still didn't have an on-ground contact. No one who spoke the local language. How would we make it work? Now, I did some research in PNG. They speak English, but I knew what that meant for English to be part of the official language because I've been to Africa and it doesn't always mean that people speak it. So like, what am I supposed to do? Buy a plane ticket and not know if we would even be able to accomplish what we were trying to accomplish because the we didn't have anybody to do it with us. Like I felt worried about that. You know, like that's a real concern. This is like thousands of dollars when I didn't have thousands of dollars to invest. And I felt like the Lord asked me in that moment, do you trust me? So I remember buying the plane tickets and investing thousands of dollars before we even knew if there would be anyone to greet us on ground when we landed. And I remember sending this email where I confirmed the purchase of the plane tickets. It was like I was lightheaded. There was a sense of worry, but, but more than that, it was a sense of anticipation like, hey God, when I sent this email, this is me betting on you that you'll come through. We finally, we're like three or four weeks out from the trip. And I was like freaking out because I was like, we don't have an on-ground contact. What's God going to do? We're getting to the point where we're deciding, okay, so what can we do? What do we know for sure how to do once we land there? (laughs) That's the conversation that we're having at that point. And finally, someone reaches out and says, hey, I know a guy who knows a guy who might be willing to help you out. And his name was Simon, this guy who was known by a guy who was known by this person who reached out to me. On our first Facebook call, our mutual love for God and our passion for the unreached made us fast friends. We made plans. And before we knew it, I was shaking his hand on ground in Papua New Guinea. It was a journey filled with all kinds of interesting difficulties getting there. And then when we were there, (laughs) it got even more intense blessings and surprises. Our rental car was only willing to go to Hagini if we paid a huge amount of money because there were bandits on the road. Before we reached our final destination, the road ran out and they told us they needed to turn back. So they, so they left us in a town, something like 11 or 12 miles from our final destination. And we had to walk the rest of the way. When we arrived, it was almost as if they were expecting us. They had just finished, this is a blessing, they had just finished building a small cabin and they invited us to stay inside. Over the course of the next two weeks, we watched as God unfolded his burden for these people. We preached, we shared the gospel, we showed the Jesus film. We we watched as God just did amazing things in the lives of these people and reminded them that he loved them and cared for them and even gave them a, a burden to take the gospel to other villages who had not heard about Jesus. We just, I was amazed. God moved. He, he fulfilled his promise all the way back when we were deciding whether or not to purchase the plane tickets. He said, do you trust me? And he came through. On our way out, we had to catch a public transportation and it it took us 13 hours to get from where we were to where we needed to be. And in the middle of that 13 hours, we had to drive through a tribal war where men blocked the road with improvised guns. It was a crazy time, (laughs) but while all the while God was faithful, he, he came through all the while he moved and, and, and the people there were transformed by his power. He did exactly what he promised he would do. God's faithfulness was on display time and time and time again. Taylor and I are currently in the middle of a a, a time where we're watching God's faithfulness on display. We've been living uh, in in God's blessing for for many years in in the basement of a a rental property that my in-laws own. And we've been able to live there rent-free while Taylor's been going to school and I've been... um, in ministry and not really making very much money and God's just provided. And we recently felt like the Lord was saying, it's now time to move out. So we waited on the Lord and waited for, uh, we listened for his voice and, and we visited properties and we were like, what about this one? And he would say no. And we're like, well, this one makes a lot of sense. And he was like, not that one. And what about this one? No, but it makes so much sense. God, not that one. Just wait. And if you guys know anything about the current 
Like this is just happening in our life in the last two weeks. If you know anything about like the housing market right now, it's insane. Houses are going for like 50, 60, 70, tens of thousands of dollars over the asking price, even over the appraised value of the property. They're just skyrocketing insane (laughs) amounts of money. And so every time that we say no to a property under the prompting of the Holy Spirit, we're like, man, I hope God comes through. And can I just tell you, yesterday, today's Friday as I'm recording this, yesterday, God came through. Thursday, he came through. He brought us a townhome that we could not have asked for in our wildest dreams. And he provided like serious funds to pay for it. I can't even tell you, I can't even tell you what it felt like knowing that he had this plan all along, trusting him, trusting his promises that he would provide. It was worth it. I find myself often thinking back to stories like this as I go through difficult times, knowing that because he came through for me, then he'll come through for me again. And these are just my stories. I know that God has done many of these same things for all of you, provided for you in ways you weren't expecting, protected you in ways that were surprising, cared for you, and made things possible that you didn't think were possible. In fact, I would like to take a quick survey, and obviously this would make more sense if we were in the same room, but who here has seen God's faithfulness in their life in some small or big way? Just maybe just as a testament testament to whoever's sitting in the room with you, you can just raise your hand. And, and maybe you've seen it twice. God is faithful. We can trust that God will do the things that he says that he'll do. In my mind, that has a huge implication for our lives. Not only can we more fully understand that our faith is established and rooted and grounded in the very concrete hope of God's faithfulness, not in some ethereal grasping at straws thing in the air dependent on us, but dependent on him. We can also have confidence in situations that require extraordinary faith because God has never broken his promises. I'm reminded of the story of Peter walking on water in Matthew 14. It's perhaps one of the most famous, well-known examples of faith. As you all know from the story, Jesus sends his disciples to the other side of the lake. Meanwhile, he remains back and dismisses a crowd who was there at the time and then goes to pray. Just before the dawn, the disciples are facing this crazy storm out on the lake, and Jesus comes to them walking on the water. And at first, the disciples are like, He's a ghost. (laughs) But then Jesus calls out, don't worry, it's me. Peter challenges Jesus, which is kind of crazy. If you really, if it's really you, call me to you on the water. Jesus says to Peter, come. Peter then walks on water, but seeing the wind and the waves, he begins to sink and calls to Jesus to save him. Of course, Jesus does. And they walk safely back to the boat. And in this moment, Jesus' words to Peter are simple and straightforward. O you of little faith, O you of little faith, why do you doubt? We have heard that story so many times that it has almost become something that we're immune to. Our, like, this is a crazy, insane story. <laughs> a flesh and bone man, just like you and me, was able to walk on water simply because Jesus said, yeah, come on over. It's an astounding story, an insane story. And I think this story has a lot to teach us about how we respond to God's faithfulness and how we can have faith. And I think the primary thing to notice is that faith consistently goes hand in hand with action. We as followers of the one true God, the living Jesus, are called to do some crazy things. Jesus says that as his followers, we are sent out as sheep in the midst of wolves. We are called to share the news of the living God with the lost, the broken, the dying in the world, a a world marred by sin and overcome by hate. We're called to respond to evil with good, to help those in need, to live lives of, of radical love for God and those around us. We're called to live lives of faithful, trusting, dependent action on God. 
But when I look out on the body of Christ, that is not the, that's not what I see. I see, just like in the story of Peter walking on water, the 11 other disciples sitting still in the boat. From my view, our stats are even worse than theirs. <laughs> this kind of action-oriented, Jesus-obeying faith that Peter had seems to be so extremely rare in the modern church, so rare that we elevate those in our churches and communities who actually live it out. They become famous. We look at them and think to ourselves, I could never do what they do or say what they say or go where they go. I couldn't. And it's heartbreaking because I can tell you, as someone who very consistently hears phrases like that, I could never do what you do. I couldn't disagree more. I am the absolute least likely candidate to live the life that I'm currently living in this moment. I know you think that's an exaggeration, but it's not. <laughs> not only am I not much of an adventurer, but I have always had a weak digestive system. I'm pr I have like this crazy social anxiety where I would throw up whenever I went over to a friend's house as a kid. And even on the first day of school, I'd throw up because I got so anxious. I was immature in my relationship with God. I didn't even know how to say hi to some people, let alone tell them about Jesus. I was passionate about all the wrong things. I cared more about being right than I cared about loving people. I cared more about me and my comfort and my security than I cared about other people. I wanted to, uh, I wanted to dedicate my life to earning money and living comfortably. I, I, I could go on and on. This. I would bore you by all of the things that disqualify me from living a life of faith. All that to say, this idea that only some Christians can live lives of faithful, radical dependence and obedience is completely absurd. Completely ridiculous. It could not be further from the truth. In some places on the planet, Every believer has to live a life of faith or they couldn't be a Christian because being a Christian in those places means daily risking your life and the lives of those you love. Not sure how anyone could do that without radical dependence on God and radical faith in God. It certainly isn't peer pressure keeping them in the midst of that deep, diff, deep dark difficulty. Our lives should all be characterized by radical faith in God. And that will look different for each of us, of course. Some, for some of us, that might mean getting in an airplane and flying to some random place around the world and preaching the gospel. For others of us, it might mean being radically dependent as God provides for our needs. For others of us, it might mean having faith that, that God will give us a child or, or find us a spouse. For, uh, for some of us, that faith might mean reaching out to our neighbors. For some of us, that, that faith might mean trusting him in the midst of extreme job difficulty or homelessness for, for some, like, I mean, the list goes on, right? All of us should have lives characterized by radical faith. And it will look different, but it should be true of each of us. I think Jesus would have been ecstatic that day had 12 of the disciples decided to get out of the boat, boat and walk on water rather than, rather than just one. I know for certain that that's what Jesus is looking for from all of us. So here's the question. Do I trust Jesus? Because isn't that at the center of it all? It was because Abraham knew and trusted that God would fulfill his promises that he had faith grounded in the fact that God would fulfill his promises. Hopefully I didn't say promises too many times in that sentence. The idea is that at the center of it all was that Abraham trusted God. He trusted that God would fulfill his promises, that God would do what he said he would do, that he wouldn't do what he said he wouldn't do. Sarah, the same thing. She became a mother in her extremely old age because she trusted God. Esther trusted God and was able to save her people from annihilation. Paul and the disciples trusted God and were empowered to do the work that God called them to do even up to death. Peter trusted God and walked on water. Do we really trust God? Do we, do we really believe that he's faithful? 
Is our faith truly in him? Really? I know, like, we hear sermons about faith a lot, right? But I really encourage you, ask yourself this question. Do you trust the living God? Do you trust the God of the Bible? If you're having a hard time answering that question, I encourage you to to look at your life. Do you obey do you obey Jesus even when it's difficult or uncomfortable? When he asks you to love an enemy, when he asks you to care for that annoying family member or that family member who caused a lot of harm to you? When the Holy Spirit prompts you to do something, do you make it happen or ignore it? When he says, hey, I want you to go talk to that guy or share your faith with that guy. Or when he says, hey, are you willing to put your money where your mouth is and, and give to that person in need? Would you buy the groceries of the person standing in front of you in line? Would you, would you go where I say to go and do what I tell you to do? Do you obey Jesus even when we face the difficulties of life? When you face those difficulties, where do you turn? Do you turn to a bottle? Do you turn to a, 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 a plant that you smoke? Do you turn to a pill? Do you turn to sex or, or, or do you turn to relationships? When life gets hard, where do you turn? Old habits or to Jesus? I think the unfortunate reality for many of us is that we don't really if you look at our lives, we don't really trust Jesus. We trust ourselves. We trust presidents or, or leaders of our companies or whatever, but we don't really trust Jesus. And you can see it in how we live. The unfortunate reality is that many of us have trust issues with Jesus. My invitation to us today is simple. Put your faith in God. Trust that he will do what he has promised to do in the li- and, and, and live lives that reflect that. When the Holy Spirit says, do this, do it. When he says, go, go. When he says, wait, wait. When you encounter trials, trust that God won't break his promises. Become water walkers. Put action to your belief. Put your faith. I invite you, put your faith in God and then watch. Watch what he does. Notice the remarkable ways that he comes through for you. He will not let you down. Father, I pray in Jesus' name for your kingdom to come and your will to be done in our lives. Help us to trust you more and more each day. Help us to become men and women of radical faith, grounded and rooted in you. Lord, I pray that if there's anything that we're holding back from you in our life, that we're not trusting you with in our life, I pray that you'd bring that to our minds even right now and that we would release it to you. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that you would empower us through your Holy Spirit to do the work that you're calling us to do, just like in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, where we're saved by grace through faith, not by our works, so that no one can boast, so that we can do the good works that you have prepared in advance for us to do. And we pray that we would be empowered through your Holy Spirit to do those good works, that we wouldn't just sit around and in, inherit your grace and become spiritually fat, but that we would pour out and that we would be your faithful hands and feet here, there, and around the world. We want we want more of your kingdom here. We do. We want it. We want to live it out. We want to see you at at work doing the things that you say you'll do. We want to see your promises. And Lord, I pray that you would invite all of us on this great adventure that you have in store, this great adventure that says, hey, do you trust me more than what, you, what you're seeing and what you're feeling and what you're sensing? Do you trust me? We trust you, Lord. We put our faith in you because you have never let anyone down. You have never abandoned anyone. You have never forsaken them. We love you and we praise your holy name. Amen. Well, Grace, uh, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. 
And uh, I hope that you experience the wonderful adventure of saying yes to Jesus, even when it seems impossible. God bless.